At Penn State University, there is a tradition that ranks among the most successful in college football. The foundation is perfect. In the storybook setting of Happy Valley, the fearless Nittany Lion has become the symbol of excellence second to none. Legend after legend has helped develop one of college football's most storied traditions. A tradition that in 106 seasons has produced 11 undefeated teams, two national championships, more than 660 victories, 29 postseason bowl appearances, and 15 former Lions elected to the College Football Hall of Fame. In 1992, both triumph and frustration paid a visit to the Lions to mark this a season of old foes and new frontiers. would be a year of change, a last hurrah for many old rivals. This would be Penn State's final year as an independent, before saying goodbye to some longtime foes and beginning a Big Ten schedule. August 1992. Students return for another semester of study. Classes began, and across campus, another teacher was hard at work on the practice fields at Penn State. It is here the character of a football team takes shape. This final season as an independent would result in many excitingly close games and outstanding individual efforts. And it would conclude with another New Year's Day bowl berth. <laughs> After finishing third in the nation a year ago, the Lions roared into a new season with 12 returning starters. And a familiar name, but a new face at quarterback. Redshirt junior John Saka from Del Ram, New Jersey would make his first collegiate start. Against Cincinnati, Saka relied on the blinding speed of senior O.J. McDuffie to set up the first touchdown of 1992. Starting his first game at fullback, Brian O'Neill bowled through Bearcats to finish the drive. But in the second quarter, Saka had to leave the game with a bruised shoulder. Joe Paterno called on true freshman Wally Richardson to replace Saka at quarterback. White put the game away with a fourth period Brian O'Neill touchdown and took home a 24 to 20 victory over Cincinnati. From Harrisburg, from Erie, from Pittsburgh, from Philadelphia, thousands of fans enjoyed the perfect autumn weather and joined in traditional tailgating as the Lions opened their 1992 home season. Penn State took the field against Temple with quarterback John Sacco on the injured list. Paterno's concern was how would 18-year-old Wally Richardson react to his first start. Shelly Hammond's interception inspired another drive as Penn State's ground attack pounded out nearly 400 yards. Here's the handoff to O'Neill. To hold up the middle, he's at the 40. Breaks a tackle, he's at the 45, the 50. Brian O'Neill is turning all the speed. He's at the 20, the 15, the 10. Here's the quarterback sneak. Wally Richardson is in for the touchdown. 
Led by Reggie Gibbons and Lou Benfatti, the Lion defense also turned up the heat. With Temple going nowhere, Richardson confidently showed the strength of his young arm. Penn State had played with improved confidence, scored 33 second half points, and made Temple victim number two, 49 to eight. Ranked among the top 10 in the country, with John Sacker returning at quarterback, Penn State found Eastern Michigan no threat to the success of the young season. The Lions put on a scoring blitz that produced 28 points in just 11 minutes. Full fluttering kick. OJ will have a chance to return. He takes it at the 46. He's down to the 40, 45, 30, 25, 20, and down to the 17-yard line. He's a pitch back to Richie, heading to the outside, cut back in the five. He's in for the touchdown. Third wide receiver in the game for Eastern Michigan is Rodney Screen. And here is an interception by Shelly Hammonds, and Hammonds is going to waltz in for a touchdown. Saka handing off to Richard Anderson. Off tackle to the right. Cuts back. He's at the 15, the 10, 5. Touchdown, Richard Anderson. Saka is straight back to pass. He's looking, and he throws deep down the far sideline. Tyson Thomas makes the catch at the 17. John is going to put it up. Looking. He throws one into the end zone for O.J. McDuffie. Complete for a touchdown. That four-touchdown explosion, another end zone McDuffie catch, and the sprinter speed of sophomore Kajana Carter Climax an explosive 52 to 7 victory. With the Maryland game several days away, two former Ivy Leaguers renewed a friendship in front of the Penn State squad. President George Bush of Yale and Joe Paterno of Brown talked some football, and the players enjoyed the experience of a lifetime. Later, they could have played Hail to the Chief for Penn State, with the first verse dedicated to a special play by O.J. So it's a middle screen to the wide receiver. It's just a thing where, you know, the, the linemen block for a second, then they let all the pass rush come in, and I sneak in behind the pass rush, and, you know, it's all my linemen against some small DBs, basically. So it's just, you know, I feel sorry for the DBs because it's pretty much a cakewalk into the end zone a lot of times. The defense was stubborn and unyielding. Linebackers Richard McKenzie and Reggie Givens hammered the Terps from sideline to sideline. While Phil Yaboa Cody and Lou Ben Fatty were mountains in the middle. But the headlines of the day belong to a former Maryland High School Player of the Year named Richie Anderson. The multi-talented red shirt senior scored four touchdowns. Six thousand fans who filled Beaver Stadium savored every moment of Anderson's magical afternoon. Saka takes the snap, hands it off to Richard Anderson. Zigs and zags at the line of scrimmage, breaks through. He's at the 15, 10, 5, touchdown! What a run by Richard Anderson! Saka though, handing off on the draw play to Richard Anderson again. Zigs and zags. He's at the 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! Penn State. Anderson's 24 points led the Lions to a convincing 49-13 win over Maryland. Playing in Giants Stadium against Rutgers, the defense set the tone. Offense energized itself with a fourth down call that worked to perfection. Fourth down play for Penn State. Inches to go. There's Moser in motion. The handoff to Richard Anderson. No, he faked the handoff. He's got Brady wide open oh, yeah. in the end zone. Throws complete. Touchdown, Penn State. Kyle Brady of Camp Hill put the Lions up 7-3 and ignited a Penn State air show. John Saka became the third passer in school history to throw for more than 300 yards in a game. 
Joe Paterno simply watched defenders like Reggie Gibbons smother the Knights, allowing him to put the ball back in his quarterback's hand. Saka is back to pass. Has good protection, only a three-man rush goes into the end zone. It's complete for a touchdown to O.J. McDuffie. A leaping grab for the touchdown. McDuffie grabbed eight passes, accounted for more than 130 all-purpose yards, and scored two touchdowns. Penn State finished with a 38-24 win over Rutgers and now stood at 5-0. <laughs> On the eve of the Miami game, thousands of Lion fans demonstrated their loyalty at a massive pep rally. This In front of a national television audience and a Beaver Stadium record crowd, the Lions responded to their coach's promise. They played their hearts out. They outhit Miami. They outran Miami. They outpassed Miami. They maintain possession six and one half minutes longer than Miami. They limited Hurricane quarterback Gino Toretta to only 80 yards passing and Miami's high-powered offense to under 220 total yards. But Anderson's 116 yards on the ground. Troy Drayton's seven receptions. That incredible defensive effort and the team's two touchdowns weren't enough. And Miami escaped the Lions' den with a 17-14 triumph. As Penn State fans gathered for homecoming, they had to look past one of the most frustrating setbacks in recent memory. Boston College was Penn State's it's opponent, program, and Lion fans were ready. We For the second consecutive right. week, ABC Television zeroed in on a packed Beaver Stadium. The full house was stunned as the Lions fell behind during a wild first half. But Paterno kept his team focused, and in the third quarter, they mounted a comeback. First coming around to O.J. McDuffie. O.J.'s at midfield. He's down to the 45, to the 40, to the 35, 30. O.J. to the 20, the 15, and knocked out of bounds. Hand off to Anderson. He dies. He's in for the touchdown. Touchdown, Penn State. In the final period, they narrowed the margin even more. Straight back to pass again. Goes underneath, complete to McDuffie at the two. He's in for the touchdown. Here's the two-point conversion attempt. Sackle takes a good drop. He looks, he's pumped, he's under pressure, throws into the end zone, and it's caught. Mike Archie makes the catch for the two-point conversion. When Sackle re-injured his shoulder, Kerry Collins took over for the first time this season. In five plays, the sophomore from West Lawn marched the Lions some 90 yards with Anderson finishing the drive. Again, they elected to go for two, and the Lions trailed by just three points. With a little more than 90 seconds to play, Kyle Brady recovered the onside kick. But there would be no miracles today. The Lions' tough, gritty comeback fell three points short. For Penn State, Boston College had been a frustrating day. For O.J. McDuffie, it was one of the finest individual games of his brilliant career. 
The versatile seniors 11 catches for 212 yards against BC set school records and put one of the most extraordinary athletes in Penn State history closer to owning a majority of the Lion receiving an all-purpose record. There's a lot of great names in the Penn State record book and for mine to be one of those names now, it's, it's a great thrill for me. He's one of those type of players that when you, when you really needed something to happen, he could make it. I think the one thing uh, I would say about OJ is, is just he's a 100% person, 110% player. Well, I think OJ McDuffie's one of the great football players ever played at Penn State, and I think he did a tremendous job, a great competitor, uh, gave it everything he had, not only on the field, but in practice, and, and in every aspect of the game. He's a good blocker, he ran tough, he, was, he played tough, uh, and obviously we're gonna miss him. Phenomenal. A lot of people don't get a chance to go to college stuff. And just the, the experience I, I witnessed here, playing for Joe Paterno, meeting some of the guys that played on national championship teams, some legends in football, period. It's overwhelming just to know the people that I've met here. I, I tell my mom all the time, I never, when I go home, I never unpack my bags, you know, because that's my vacation spot. And Penn State was my home. Penn State and West Virginia first met in 1904. Now in Morgantown, 88 years later, they would play the final game in this rivalry. For the third time this season, a Penn State quarterback was making his first collegiate start. Gary Collins drove the Lions 80 yards on their initial possession. The game then turned into a back and forth struggle. Richie Anderson, leading all of college football in scoring, gained 133 yards. And Collins and Troy Drayton combined on the season's longest play. They ran the play in and Kerry Collins looked at me and um, he called, you know, it was, a, it was a screen pass to the tight end. Back to pass is Kerry Collins. Here's a quick screen over the middle. It's complete to Drayton. Drayton is at the 45, the 50, down to the 45, the 40. He's down to the 35, 30, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Penn State. Everything I had to do was run, run the daylight, make a couple cuts, and, and I was home free. The halftime score read 19 to 16, Penn State. Defenders like Brett Wright and Derek Bonner made life miserable for Mountaineer quarterback Jake Kelchner. Reggie Givens, number 58, scooped up a West Virginia fumble at the Lion 1. And B.J. Masillo avoided trouble with a clutch punt out of the blue and white end zone. With a little less than six minutes to play, the game was tied and the Lions would regain possession deep in their own territory. Could they drive the length of the field? Third down and long for the Nittany Lions. Here's Collins back to pass, a three-man rush, and the throw, and it's complete to McDuffie at the 22. That's enough for a Penn State first down. Collins back to pass, only a three-man rush. Collins throwing the deep out pattern to the far side. It's complete! Running down the sideline, Justin Williams, and he's out of bounds at the West Virginia 35. Here's the handoff to O'Neill. Follows a block by Rucci. He's at the 20, the 15, the 10. O'Neill is down to the five and four yard line. Penn State of the West Virginia four were tied at 26. The pitch back to Richard of Anderson. He cuts back, he dives. He's in for the touchdown. A dramatic game winning drive. The Lions showed determination to simply not be stopped. In the dying seconds, a steal by Bill Yaboa Cody assured a 40-26 triumph over West Virginia. <laughs> 
Not only was the flight to Provo, Utah, the longest of the year, but when you play Brigham Young, you expect severe turbulence in the air. The Cougars did not disappoint as they passed their way to an early advantage. Despite outscoring BYU 14-3 in the second half, Penn State could not overtake a Cougar team playing its finest game of the year. the great intersectional rivalries of the past several decades would play its final act as Penn State visited Notre Dame. The Lions had won eight of the last 11 games between these two college football giants. They get back to pass again, Myra. He's looking under pressure again. Unloads down the middle. It is picked off. Intercepted at the 20-yard line. Running it back for Penn State is Lee Rubin. High formation in the backfield. O'Neal and Anderson. Here's the hand to Anderson, he dives, he is in for the touchdown. The first two periods concluded with Notre Dame unable to penetrate the Lions end zone. And two Irish field goals created a six to six deadlock after a tightly played first half. The Lions were ready to untie the knot when Brian Gelsheiser recovered a fumble. Less than seven minutes to play, Anderson jump-started a 44-yard six-play drive that was destined to find the Notre Dame end zone. Here's a fake handoff and a throw and a completion to McDuffie. He's at the 20. He's to the 15 and taken down there. And the handoff to O'Neal has a hold. He's at the 5. He's in for the touchdown. Touchdown, Penn State. Brian O'Neal, a 14-yard run. The celebration was short-lived as the Irish scored their only touchdown of the game in the final 20 seconds, added a two-point conversion, and eked out a 17-16 victory in the stunning conclusion of a monumental college football rival. Penn State and Pitt. Two traditional foes teeing it up for the 92nd time. The Lions' Brian O'Neill scored the only points of the first period. O'Neill would play his finest game ever with 105 yards and four touchdowns. If you look at the tape, the offensive line was just unbelievable. Uh, I mean, the holes were just humongous, and I just did what anybody was doing in the young team. When Pitt struggled back to score, Penn State's special teams turned the conversion attempt this into down, two the points. Extra point kick is up and blocked. Penn State will scramble for it, and here they go. It's scooped up, and Lee Rubin is running downfield with it. He's at the 40, 35, 30. Lee Rubin is going to take it into the end zone, so Penn State will pick up a couple of points. Just three snaps later, another Penn State big play for a 23-6 halftime lead. Here's the pitch back to Richard Anderson. Goes through the line. Penn State's overpowering ground attack opened the secondary for O.J. McDuffie. Is on. Throws to the outside for McDuffie. It's complete inside the five. Brian Curley in motion and a handoff. Goes to Brian O'Neill around the right side. He pulls in for the touchdown. Pure strength by Brian O'Neill to get it in from three yards out. When McDuffie grabbed his ninth touchdown catch of the year, it was another Lion record. This game had been a test of Penn State pride, and they responded with a 57-13 triumph over longtime rival Pitt, and finished 1992 as the sixth highest scoring team in college football. For the seniors, it was a victory to savor in their final game at Beaver Stadium. As I was walking out of the field, I was like, God, I'm never going to play in front of 95,000 people ever again. 
I mean, everybody's out there bleeding blue and white. This is the worst weather conditions, but everybody's here and they're cheering us on. And you just looked at the guys you've been here with so long and all the hard work that you put in with each other and the, the, in the sad times and the good times you had in Beaver Stadium to think, well, now it's my turn. You know, this is the last game I'm going to play, and now I'm going out as, like, like I've seen all the other seniors in the past, and now finally my time's come. The seniors had fought through some tough times and now enjoyed this sweet triumph to close out the regular season. Penn State! For Penn State, another New Year's Day, another bowl visit. The Lions' 29th postseason appearance. This one for a battle with Stanford and a meeting of two of the finest coaches in the game of football. paid one final visit to the Lions and the first day of 1993 was not a happy holiday for Penn State. Looking back on the 1992 season, the Lions targeted the pass as a major weapon, gaining more yards through the air than on the ground. Two senior receivers led the charge into the Penn State record book. Troy Drayton of Steelton came to Penn State as a wide receiver, switched to tight end, and finished 1992 with more receptions at tight end than any player in Lion history. A second record smasher was co-captain O.J. McGuffey whose extraordinary 1992 season included breaking or tying 15 major Penn State receiving, return, and all-purpose yardage records. McDuffie was named the Lions' outstanding senior. Greg Huntington was named outstanding senior lineman. Reggie Givens, unsung hero. E.J. Sandusky, recognized for leadership and scholarship and Chris Caesar, the winner of the first John Bruno Award for Outstanding Special Teams Play. It was the final senior class at Penn State that would play as an independent. For more than 40 returning lettermen, 1993 will introduce a new frontier in Penn State football history as the Lions initiate play in the Big Ten Conference. The winner of the Big Ten goes to the Rose Bowl and Penn State played in the first West Coast New Year's Day Classic in 1923. Flashback to Iowa, 1971. The year All-America Lydell Mitchell topped college football in scoring. Running mate Franco Harris of Mount Holly, New Jersey, later earned four Super Bowl rings with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Iowa fell 44 to 14. Two years later, the 1973 Lions roared through the Hawkeyes with a tailback from Upper Derby named John Capaletti, Heisman Trophy winner and future member of the College Football Hall of Fame. Who can forget one of the most feared defenses in college football? With all Americans like Farrell's Randy Crowder, Bethlehem's Mike Hartenstein, and Warren's Ed O'Neill. Any wonder this Penn State team crushed Iowa and finished 1973 a perfect 12-0. Back in 1952, the Lions and Purdue concluded a two-game series, 
This was Rip Angle's third Penn State team and first to win seven games. With Steelton's Tony Rados at quarterback, the Lions' aerial attack included basketball great and current member of the Penn State Board of Trustees, Jesse Arnell, and future Boston College head coach, Joe Yukika. In a game played on Old Beaver Field in the main campus area, Penn State tied favored Purdue when Chambersburg's Don Heyer stopped the visitors' final effort. State, undefeated in one of the East pigskin powerhouses, travels to Cleveland's rain-swept municipal stadium for an intersectional battle with once-defeated Illinois. Angles team won nine games, and the longtime voice of college football, Chris Schenkel, was caught up in the exploits of the Lion quarterback, Ramblin' Richie Lucas. Watch in slow motion as Richie Lucas fakes nicely and then slants off left tackle to go in for the touchdown. Maxwell Trophy winner Lucas, now assistant athletic director at Penn State, was joined in the backfield by Dick Pay, Pat Petula, Dick Hoke, and Jim Kerr. The team from the East invaded the heartland of the Big Ten and whipped Illinois at their own game of hard rock football. And smother the Illinois threat. Defensive plays like this one help Penn State score an impressive 20-9 victory over Illinois to keep the Nittany Lions unbeaten in six games. Penn State's greatest success in Big Ten competition has been with Ohio State. In eight Buckeye battles, the Lions have won six. 1978 Maxwell Award winner Chuck Fusina of McKee's Rock quarterbacked in 19 to nothing dominance of the highly touted Buckeyes. An immensely talented Lion defense was built around three All-Americans. Bruce Clark, Matt Millen, and Pete Harris. Buckeyes and Lions next met on the 1980 Fiesta Bowl, where the structure of a national championship team was beginning to take shape. And this team, built around Kirk Warner and Todd Blackledge, would win 21 games the following two seasons. But when Penn State fans recall their most cherished triumph over the Big Ten, the historic 1964 invasion of Columbus is the one they talk about. Woody Hayes, mighty football machine at Ohio State, a monster in size and talent, risks its number two national rating against the Nittany Lions from Penn State. Almost 85,000 Buckeye boosters jam Ohio Stadium, and they've come to see an Ohio State rout. But Rip Engel's Lions, who got off to a slow start, have developed into a smooth operating team. Rip Engel called this 1964 squad his most memorable team ever as they won their final five games of the season. The Nittany Lions get a big break here as Tom Urbanek hits the line and fumbles. There's a scramble for the ball and the man who covers it is Dirk Nye. It's a touchdown for Penn State and the Lions take a surprising 7 to nothing lead after the first period. In the game of their lives. As Penn State swings back on offense. It's Penn State looking like the mighty football machine today. And that's Don Kunit knifing in the pay dirt as the Lions up their lead to 20 to nothing after three periods. The ball control offense with runners Don Kunit, Tom Urbanek, Dave McNaughton, and quarterback Gary Weidman pounded out an unbelievable 27 to nothing advantage. Ohio State has not been shut out in 45 games, but that becomes ancient history as Tommy Bedick intercepts on under first pass on the goal line. Penn State's victory over the number two team in the country was voted the upset of the year by Associated Press and still lives today as one of the greatest triumphs in Penn State history. These hot rivalries with Big Ten teams will continue to grow even bigger. We've all been waiting to get into the Big Ten. It's, uh, I think it's obvious what's, what's happened with our basketball already. The excitement that we've had in, 
in rec hall for the Big Ten basketball games, both men and women, and the wrestling. I think that a tremendous excitement and a, and a, a, a being in the best conference in the country. So one of a better way to get a very exciting time for all of us, and especially for me, because I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting in there. When I think about bowls, I think about the Rose Bowl. Everyone's going to be gunning for the new kid on the block, and that's going to be us. What we'll do now is, is try and develop a new reputation in the Big Ten. That reputation will come from a group of determined Nittany Lions. From college football's winningest active coach. From the support of college football's third largest home attendance. And from the tradition that goes with college football's fifth all-time winningest team. A new frontier awaits Penn State with competition in the most prestigious conference in college football. Look out, Big Ten. Here comes Penn State. Penn State, 1993, would be a journey into the unknown. I'm edgy and excited and all the kinds of things I was when I first took over as a head coach. New opponents, never been in a conference, not sure exactly what the pressures of a conference are going to be like. So, I mean, all those things are things that uh, I feel, I've said them before, and they, and they, they continually uh, are with me. Penn State's inaugural season in the Big Ten would be filled with new opponents, big plays, giant comebacks, and most of all, the pride, the toughness, and the success that is epitomized by Nittany Lion football. He has time, he's going deep downfield, Engram is open, he catches the ball at the 10, Before the long-awaited debut of Big Ten competition, many players enjoyed their summer in University Park. Soon it was time to put on the gear and get serious. Real serious. <laughs> Competition was near. The Lions were ready. The Big Ten from Minnesota is what we've been waiting for. Check it out. For the first time in history, a Big Ten flag greeted Lion followers as they entered Beaver State. Each fan was given a special commemorative coin to mark the historic occasion. It was a new beginning. Penn State, Minnesota. After 994 games as an independent, the blue and white played their first one that counted in conference standings. Less than two minutes into the new season, following a Derek Bonney interception, the Lions scored on their first Big Ten offensive right play. Side. Here's the quick screen out to Ingram. He's down to the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. Touchdown, Penn State! Bobby Ingram following a great block by Mike Malinowski. Takes it in from 28 yards. A 5'10 sophomore making his first start in a blue and white uniform, Engram was stepping up to replace O.J. McDuffie as Penn State's big play receiver. Engram thrilled the 95,000 fans on hand for this opener with three first period touchdowns. The defense, always a lion strength, returned seven starters from 1992, and the Gophers felt their wrath popping up five turnovers. Sophomore 
Nebraska, Jonna Carter from Westerville, Ohio, would become one of the top runners in the Big Ten. But on this special Saturday, individual honors belong to England, who entered the record book with four touchdown catches in one game. A Penn State first. to 20 conference triumph over Minnesota launched a new era for Penn State football. No place reveals the intensity of this squad any more than the Penn State locker room. 100%! It was shortly before kickoff of the Lions' intersectional game with Southern California. Every play, all out, have a little fun doing it, a little enthusiasm, be aggressive, nobody worry about anything but let it all hang out. All hang got, out have a little fun out there. Swing the ball, let's go. As more than 95,000 roared their approval, Penn State welcomed the Trojans to their first visit ever to Beaver Stadium. Archie sheds a tackle. He's at the 20. He's down to the 15. Still In a battle of two programs known for producing Carter. great right tailbacks, Penn State runners proved the more Archie prolific on this day. Here goes Archie. He's at the midfield strike. Down to the 40. 35. 30. He's still going to the 25-yard line of USC. Archie turned receiver for the game's first touchdown. While senior fullback Brian O'Neill hammered in for two more. Lion back scored 21 first half points. State's defense limited Southern Cal to just 34 yards rushing. All over the Trojans was senior Lou Benfatti, number 55, with seven tackles and one interception. It appeared the 21 points would hold up until a final period comeback by the Trojans threatened the Lions' lead. With less than a minute to play, USC scored to climb within one point of Penn State. The visitors daringly went for two and hoped to pull out a last-second victory. The outcome rested on this one play. Going to go straight drive Here we go. Johnson throws. Did he make no. the catch? No catch. Incomplete. No, catch. no good. Incomplete. And the Nittany Lions have held. It's a two-point conversion that could have beat us. We had to stop him, and we did, and I think it was just a springboard that sent us into the rest of the season with uh, a lot of confidence. Boarding their charter flight for Iowa City, Lion players wondered how they would respond to their first road trip as a member of the Big Ten. And would this be the day their coach gained a monumental 250th career win? The host Iowa Hawkeyes proved no match for an opportunistic and punishing Penn State defense. Terry Killens got to him, plays back to pass, he's hit the ball, popped out, Eric Clare catches it, and he goes down to the 25. Where he Blue and White Thunder set up the only touchdown of the first half. The handoff to Brian O'Neill comes in, dies, he's in for the touchdown. Taking a 10 to nothing lead into the third period, the Lions fired still another rocket. To the 20, 25, the 30, 35, 40, Shelly Hammond's off and running. He's at the 50, 45, 40, and dragged down. Harry Collins hands off to Stephen Pitts, sweeping right, cuts it back, he's at the 5, Pitts dives, he's in for the touchdown. Turnovers and touchdowns were Penn State's roadmap to victory. Throws over the middle. This one is intercepted by Brian Gelsheiser. What a catch to the 40-yard line as he made a leaping interception. And the pitch to Kijana Carter follows a block by Bill. He's down to the 15, the 10, the 5. Touchdown, Kijana Carter. 23-yard run. For the second consecutive week, the Lions held an opponent to under 35 yards rushing. They dropped Iowa quarterback Paul Burmeister nine times for minus 89 yards. They handed Iowa its first home shutout in 15 years, 31 to nothing. Joe Paterno, 
became the only active college coach with 250 career victories as Penn State gained its first road success in the Big Ten. After their successful initiation into Big Ten play, and with Kerry Collins emerging as the starting quarterback, the Lions increased their win streak to five, with convincing victories over Rutgers in front of an ESPN primetime audience, and then Maryland. The Lions literally ran the Terrapins out of Bird Stadium with a defense that grounded the run and shoot. And an offense that could run, shoot, and score. Carter follows a block by Brian O'Neill. He's through. He's to the 50, 45, 40, 35, 30. Kijana is going to take it all the way. Touchdown. Kijana again. He's at the five. Runs over a man and goes in for the touchdown. Off on the counter to Mike Garchi. He's around the right side. He's through. He's to the 50, 45, 40. Turn it on the speed. 30, 25, 20. A little semi roll to the left. Throws into the end zone. Complete for a touchdown. Bobby Engel. The handoff to Kijana. Breaks a tackle at the line of scrimmage. He's to the 30. 25, cuts outside at the 20, the 15, 10, 5, touchdown! Gary Collins is back to pass, fires on the slant to Bobby Engram. It's complete and he's in for the touchdown! touchdown. Goes around the right side, he's in on touch. Touchdown! Final score, 70 to 7. As the splendor of mid-October visited Happy Valley, Penn State had played 999 football games over 106 years. They were now ready for number 1,000. The historic occasion and the long-anticipated matchup with Michigan was one of eight network telecasts for Penn State in 1993. The Lions brought a 5-0 record and a number seven national ranking into this first ever meeting with the Wolverine. A record crowd of 96,719 jammed Beaver Stadium. In this battle of two traditional powers, the Lions used the top rushing attack in the Big Ten to control the early going. The kicking of Craig Fayak and the long distance combo of Collins to Engram gave the Lions a 10 point lead. Two of the winningest teams in college football history struggled for 60 minutes. The Wolverines finally pulled out a 21-13 triumph with two second-half touchdowns. The setback, the Lions' first of the season, frustrated their drive to the top of the Big Ten. An early season snow in the unbeaten Buckeyes of Ohio State made it a cold day in Columbus for the Lions. After winning six of eight previous games with the Buckeyes, Penn State hoped to extend that success. Kajana Carter cut through the Ohio State defense for more than 120 yards. Craig Fayak's second field goal of the game put him in the record book as Penn State's all-time scorer with 249 points. The man he replaced was number 23, All-American Lydell Mitchell who led the 1971 Lion team to an 11-1 record and a top five ranking. Mayak's field goals were not enough to derail the Red Hot Buckeye. The question then became, would this Lion squad be strong enough to bounce back after two consecutive losses? The answer would come over the next four weeks. Penn State was 5-2, and two, 
with four critical conference games remaining. It was time for coaches and players to look within themselves. It was time for pride and senior leadership to get this squad back on track. It was time to go to work. Second down play, here comes the blitz. The draw play it started up. like a Penn State blow-up. The 10, he's down to the two-yard line. Here's the pitch back to Kajana, sweeping the right side, tries to spin, and he's in for the touchdown. Was hit at the four-yard line, but spun away and carried a tackler into the end zone. Touchdown, Penn State. But Indiana showed that a 7-1 record did not belie its skills. After 30 minutes of back-and-forth football, the first ever meeting between the Lions and the Hoosiers was tied at 17. The big play fireworks continued into the second half as Bobby Ingram showed why he was becoming one of the most exciting players in college football. When Collins fired a strike to Ingram, Penn State had built a 14-point lead. But in a wild seven-minute spree, Indiana scored twice to again tie this Big Ten shootout. For the Lions, it was do or die. And here comes the blitz again. Collins is scrambling, throws downfield, completes it to Ingram at the 25. He's at the 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Penn State! Bobby Ingram from Kerry Collins, and the Nittany Lions go ahead. Tim can't play to Kerry Collins. He scrambled out of the pocket, kept his poise, and Bobby Ingram did not stop. He did the break off his route, gave him a target, found a, an open area, and carried to a perfect pass for a touchdown. Ingram's 10th touchdown catch of the year not only put the Lions ahead to stay, but put him in the record book ahead of O.J. McDuffie. It's definitely bragging rights, and he'll, he'll definitely be getting a call from me. The victory was preserved by one final huge defensive play. Coming after Pacey. He ducks under. He throws deep down the middle. It's intercepted by Tony Pittman at the 10. He's out to the 20, the 25, and out of bounds at the 29 yard line. In a game that looked a lot more like a Penn State Indiana basketball match, the two teams combined for 69 points and 878 yards. The Lions' 38-31 win showed the heart of this 1993 team. We're starting on a roll. It's like a new season now, a new four-game season, and we're taking as that, and now it's the first, first chunk of the four down. When Illinois visited University Park, they still had dreams of the Rose Bowl. But the Lions quickly turned those dreams into a nightmare forcing the Illini into an afternoon of costly mistakes. Marlon Forbes' fumble recovery set up one of the strangest plays of the season. High formation of the backfield, Whitman and Archie. Hand off to Archie in the draw play. He's to the 20, to the 15, still going in the 10. He's in the 5. Archie, he fumbles the ball into the end zone. Scrambles for the ball in the end zone. Let's see what happens. Archie fumbled it into the end zone, and what will it be? He fumbled that crossing into the end zone. The officials are getting everybody off of the ball, and the indication is touchdown. A second look shows what really happened on the mystery touchdown. As Archie neared the end zone, he lost the football, only to have it stolen right out from under an Illinois player by Chip LaMarca for the six points. The Lions fired many weapons at Illinois, including the Big Ten's number one punt return unit. Against the conference's leading rush defense, Penn State's overpowering ground game blasted out four first-half touchdowns. Joe Paterno then put the game in the hands of his swarming defense. Back to pass, and he goes down to the two-yard line. Tony Pittman over the middle. Complete was tight, and the ball is jarred out of there, but it's incomplete. Here comes the blitz. Johnson being flushed out of the pocket. He goes down. Shotgun again and a four man run. Nine quarterback sacks. Five takeaways. In a 28 to 14 win over Illinois, the defense had played a major role. And its camaraderie continued off the field. 
our outside guys did a lot to uh, you know cause cause a lot of runners to come inside. So that's what we were focusing on. Five years, I didn't teach you better than that. <laughs> I didn't teach you how to speak better than that. Five years, come on, Talk. speak more, man. You got to. Right. Right. I don't want. I guess you got to do it. <laughs> Did you guys feel the onus was on the defense today to kind of redeem for you know what had happened last week? That means like, responsibility. <laughs> I know. We can get through this together. Two victories secure. Two to go. Both on the road. At Northwestern, Mike Archie again shouldered the ground responsibility in the absence of rushing leader Kijana Carter. The Sharon, Pennsylvania sophomore raced for 173 yards. It was the most productive ground game by a Lion back in three years. The rifle arm of Kerry Collins was just as hot as the legs of Archie. Kerry Collins is the back. junior from West Lawn tortured the Northwestern the secondary for 278 Rolls yards. Over the middle, it is complete to Kyle Brady at the 25, makes a move, he's down to the 20, and he's down to the 15. Kerry Collins back, throws over the middle, a great catch, and a touchdown, Bobby Ingram, touchdown, Penn State. Paterno's defense likewise named the Wildcats. Inside pressure by seniors Lou Ben Fatty and Kyoka Jackson disrupted the host game plan, as did interceptions by Tony Pittman and Lee Rubin. Big Ten highs of 43 points and 569 total yards marked the Lions to their third consecutive triumph. The 43-21 victory over Northwestern kept Penn State in the driver's seat for a New Year's Day Bowl. Cold Spartan Stadium was the stage, as Penn State and Michigan State played one of the wildest, most unpredictable battles of the season. In spite of some long gainers, the Lions found themselves trailing 23 to 10 in the final seconds of the first half. At the Spartan 16, Paterno waved off a possible field goal and went for six. Freddie Scott's first touchdown of the season narrowed the margin. But two Michigan State scores early in the second half put the Spartans up by 20 points. The Lions never quit. That was one of the things that kept us in the game was our attitude. I mean, we never gave up. We were down by 20 points. You know, a lot of guys, you know, were saying we're, we are going to find a way to win. We you know we're still going to find a way to win, and everybody just hung in there, and we ended up pouring out. One of the great comebacks in Penn State history was about to begin. Two yard line by Derek Bonner. Play action again. Collins looking, throwing one deep downfield. Here's Bobby Ingram. He makes the catch. It's a touchdown. Here's Outlaw in motion to the left side. Hand off to Thomas again. Off left tackle. He fumbled the ball. And Penn State recovers it. Brian Gelsheiser has it. Archie in the backfield and two tight ends. The hand off to Brian O'Neill. Off right tackle. He cuts it in. He's in for the touchdown. Miller is back to pass. The blitz is on. He's hit by Gelsheiser at the 10. On first down, Collins. He's going to put it up again. He's back. He has time. He's going deep downfield. Engram is open. He catches the ball at the 10. Touchdown, Penn State! When you're not afraid to air it out, Bill, when you got a Bobby Engram, how many times they say you shoot the cannon? I don't know what some of these teams are thinking playing him man to man. Uh, you know, I can see it in his eyes. We just looked at each other in the huddle and said, we're hooking up on this because we knew exactly what they were going to do. And uh, he, made, he made a great adjustment to it. It wasn't exactly the prettiest ball I've ever thrown, but uh, yeah, got there and uh, got the job done. That's what you work for all spring and all preseason. It's to make the big plays, and that's what everybody dreams of, making the big plays. And when you get a chance, you have to come up and make the big plays. Craig Bayak's placement provided the one-point margin of victory. Penn State had scored three touchdowns in an incredible five minutes of football. Collins' total of 352 passing yards was just four short of the Penn State single game record. The exciting 38-37 triumph at Michigan State assured the Lions a berth in the Citrus Bowl and would take its place as one of the most thrilling victories in the history of Penn State football.
We were in there and we were like, we're not quitting. We, we, we had to take some pride in ourselves, and, and we did that. Nine and two feet. Nine and two feels great, and ten and two will feel even better. And and I'm just glad to be going to Disney World. Before the trip to Orlando, 22 seniors who completed their eligibility in 1993 received some well-deserved recognition. At the annual Nittany Lion Football Banquet, sponsored by the State College Quarterback Club, each young man and his family were honored. We want to get the number one Penn State fan on here because it's very important. So we figured we go to the number one guy and get his his name right in the middle. So I say this spot for you. I appreciate it very yes, much sir. for my family. Great honor. He was a quiet kid when he came out of high school. I mean, very into himself, and I think out here it really brought out a lot of his abilities that he's got, God given the talent that he's got. And I think he's used it, and he's got a lot more to use. I really want to get up here tonight and say, by God, we got one more job to do, and we're going to get it done. And then we're going to come home and we're going to sit around and say, well, we're going to miss each other. But boy, we just really got it done. We did something that a lot of people didn't think we can do. You guys, every single one of you out there, have been something special because you never flinched. Welcome to Orlando. Well, glad to have you all down here. Penn State's Never Give Up team turned Orlando into Lion Country. As part of the special activities in Orlando, University President Dr. Joab Thomas announced a change at the top of Penn State Athletics. Jim Tarman, after 36 years of guidance and leadership to the University Athletic Program, 11 years as Athletic Director, had announced his retirement. It's my very special privilege to introduce to you the new Athletic Director at Penn State University, Mr. Tim Curley. A graduate of Penn State University, Tim Curley would begin his tenure as athletic director with the 1994 Citrus Bowl. Joe Paterno had brought his team to Orlando earlier than usual. He made it clear to every member of the squad, this game was important to Penn State football. A victory against sixth ranked Tennessee, a team Paterno considered as good as any in college football, would ensure the Lions a top 10 final ranking. I think the challenge of playing a team as good as that, when, and, and the, the fact that people didn't think you really had much of a chance to win, and most people hoped we could just make a good showing, I think those things created an atmosphere that, hey, you know, we're, we're not that bad, and we're going to show some people we're pretty good. Paterno watched his 23rd bowl team fall behind early. But as they had done the last half of the season, they never wavered in their resolve. They confidently climbed back into the game. With 184 all-purpose yards, Bobby Ingram was a constant pest to the box and would be named the game's most valuable player. Ingram's darting 35-yard run led to a Fayak field goal, and Penn State had tied the game. With a Citrus Bowl record crowd watching, blue and white defenders stuffed the usually potent foul. Then it was the offense, pounding out a clutch 65-yard drive in the dying moments of the first half. Lock running with 20 seconds to go till half. Play action. Collins is back. He throws. This one complete to O'Neill at the 20. He's at the 15 and out of bounds at the 14-yard line. Collins under center again. Hands off to Gajana Carter off tackle to the left. He's to the 10. He's to the 5. He's in for the touchdown. Touchdown, Penn State. Carter's 14-yard run coming behind a Bobby Ingram block at the goal line gave the Lions a lead they would not relinquish. Beating off the momentum of that late first half score, Shelly Hammonds opened the third period showing how he led the Big Ten in kickoff return. 
Gary Collins makes the run and the pass as the Lions flew past the Volunteers. Collins would throw for 162 yards and two touchdowns. Gary Collins rolling to the left side. He's looking. Throw wow. back to the right. Kyle Brady has it. Touchdown, Penn State. The Lions had taken command on a play where the tight end got lost in traffic. As Brady maneuvered against the flow, Tennessee's free safety, number seven, diagnosed the play, but reacted too late to stop the touchdown. Paterno's fired up defense unloaded on Tennessee, and its Heisman runner-up quarterback, Heath Schuler. Dropped passes frustrated the Vows as they seemed intimidated against the aggressive line. This offense that had averaged 42 points a game was held scoreless in the second half. When Collins led his troops on a fourth quarter drive that put the game out of reach, the Lions had accomplished their mission. They had played error-free football. They had dominated their higher-ranked opponent. They had shown balance with two touchdowns on the ground and two through the air. A 31-13 Citrus Bowl victory over Tennessee added to the accomplishments of this special team. They wanted to work hard. They wanted to be good. Everything we asked them to do, they, they did willingly and with the... Uh, and we were able to have some fun with them. And it was a, a, a situation the coach would enjoy because you had a bunch of kids who wanted to be good and were willing to work to be good and liked each other and responded to your coaching. And I think that makes for a good situation. It was Paterno's 15th bowl victory, tying him with Bear Bryant for the most all-time bowl win. Joe Paterno's Citrus Bowl champions turned their season around, winning those last five. They finished their transition year into the Big Ten with an overall 10-2 record and the highest scoring offense in the conference. The success of this attack that averaged more than 32 points a game began with a powerful offensive line. Mike Malinowski, Derek Pickett, Bucky Greeley, Marco Rivera, and Jeff Hardy provided the protection as Kerry Collins improved week by week to become the Lions' confident leader at quarterback. The running game was among the most productive ever at Penn State. With a stable of three thoroughbreds at tailback, all capable of starting, the Lions' infantry ranked among the top 15 in college football. Jonna Carter, number 32, became the seventh Penn Stater to top 1,000 yards in a season. As record crowds filled Beaver Stadium, attention often focused on the spectacular exploits of Bobby Engram. From September's first offensive play through a record-shattering season, the sophomore from Camden, South Carolina, put a scare in enemy secondary. His total reception, receiving yards, 100-yard game, and touchdown catches for a season, all ranked among the top three in Penn State history. Engram joined Tyoka Jackson, number 97, Kyle Brady, and Jeff Hardings, winning first team all Big Ten honors. Jackson, along with Lou Ben Fatty and Brian Gelsheiser, powered a defense that led the conference in turnover margin. The Nittany Lions had made an immediate impact in their tough new surroundings. It was tougher than I thought it was going to be. It was, it was fun because I think there was so much in, in intensity. You're going to play a tough team every week. And you have to be ready for that. And I think it made us better as a team. I think it, we're running into a great era in Penn State football and all of Penn State athletics and the whole university. I think the Big Ten is going to be just a great place for us to be. And I think it's, uh, we, we're just starting to see how exciting it's going to be.
This 1993 team assured itself a place in Penn State history. They confidently and successfully carried the Lion Banner into the Big Ten. They won the Citrus Bowl, and they finished as the seventh-ranked team in college football. They shared the success of a Big Ten start and a top-ten finish.